Hi, um, my name's Sam, and thanks very much, Wolf and Alex, before me. Um, now, I've been working on a technique for doing real-time area lighting um, on high-end PCs primarily for about the last six months on and off for a bit. And I actually intended to stop way, way before Christmas um, and failed. Um, and I've sort of been incrementally improving or changing or adjusting it, and we'll probably continue to do so until that GDC. So this talk is really a sort of a point in time of where I've got to. Um, so I'll talk a bit about why I'm doing this work and where I'm intending on going with it, and uh, the technique as it exists so far. So, um, so this isn't really a talk about how to do soft shadows on current console hardware. Um, if it was a talk about how to do soft shadows on current console hardware, it would basically be a big talk about um, percentage close of filtering. Uh, it would be entirely about shadow maps, and I'm still actually going to stick with shadow maps as the main technique, although in theory on high-end uh, high PCs you could do something more interesting. Um, but I'd like to kind of stay away from PCF-based stuff. I think they probably have a very large role to play in future shadows. Um, in particular, if you want a shadow that is basically a hard shadow, such as from the sunlight, and you just need it to have a realistic edge to it, percentage close of filtering is probably still going to be the way forward. And maybe you throw all sorts of other extra goodies on top. Maybe you take advantage of the fact that, um, that uh, it doesn't change over time very much, so you introduce some kind of temporal element. Maybe you do it stochastically, so it introduces a bit of noise, but the eye doesn't mind it. Or maybe you go a bit crazy and you use variant shadow mapping or some of these other interesting techniques. Or maybe you just blur the damn thing in screen space. Um, this isn't really kind of what I'm aiming at. Um, what I'm aiming at is a much, much, much softer shadow. And the reason that, there's two reasons that I consider this important. The first one is to do something that's genuinely different. Um, now, not just different, interesting and technical, but different visually. Pretty much all shadows in games look a bit like the shadows that I'm showing on screen at the minute. Um, now, I've blatantly just stolen these slides from Louis Bavois, so thank you very much, Louis, for, for, for all the slides here. But uh, in, the, uh, in the left, you can see standard PCF filtering. In the middle is a very expensive PCF filter tap. And this is basically a constant blur, effectively, over the shadow. And it suffers mainly, not because it doesn't look soft, but because the contact shadow doesn't harden as it gets to the base of the, um, the, base of the, the Buddha. And that's really kind of quite important. And it kind of shows the limits of what you can do with a constant blur. If you want a shadow that's softer than this you know, this kind of blurriness, if you want it to you know, hit the feet and kind of cement the object onto the ground and taper off nicely, then just doing constant blur is not going to cut it. So the technique on the far right here is called percentage closer soft shadows, which is actually not much to do with percentage closer filtering, bizarrely, um, and it's something I'll talk about um, to some degree. My technique is not based on this, but it is probably the closest, most practical algorithm that you could dig off the shelf right at the minute. And the kind of key thing that it does that constant, um, constant blur filters don't do is adapt the blur kernel to the distance to the blocker. Now, I'd actually like to go beyond the kind of softness of the shadow on the right and produce something a bit more like this. And so on the left, we have um, a shadow off a hand which I think you could model pretty realistically using existing techniques. And on the right, you have a massively diffused, massively blurred out shadow that kind of almost isn't even there. It's just kind of a darkening under it. This kind of error things is really dealt with by ambient occlusion at the minute, but it, it's, you know, I, I'm really not, ambient occlusion has a place in the world, but if you have a light source, the shadow should be connected to the light source, not just come from the geometry itself. So there's still this role for having a light and having uh, an extremely sharp soft shadow uh, off the bottom of it, where the shadow just kind of just kind of cuts in and out. It really, really almost doesn't exist. And there really aren't very many good techniques for getting shadows that are that soft at the minute. Um, and that's kind of what I'm aiming at: the really, really, really soft end of the spectrum. And if I crack it, and I'm actually going to claim right now that I have not cracked this, because I've kind of taken steps towards it. I have an interest looking technique, but definitely not something that I'd expect everybody to just jump out and adopt. Um, then I think we'll be able to do things in the next generation of uh, 
Plus or total specimens, assuming that they're kind of roughly based on kind of current PC hardware, which is a wild guess, um, that would look significantly different to the games that, that we have at present. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that, for instance, in this scene here, I have an entirely baked setting. Um, I've got some nice kind of uh, shadow directional light from the sun, I've got some bounce lighting, and I've got a whole load of little point lights down the corridor to the right. They're all kind of casting those little soft shadows. And we ray trace that, um, and it looks nice. But if I'm uh, offline on uh, on my development PC at work, where I have you know, a fancy GPU and a fancy CPU, I don't really want to have to edit this in something, some really crude looking OpenGL mode, and then hit a bake button, and then see what the end results are like. I actually want it to look much more like this. And this is what we can do at the minute with fully dynamic uh, lighting with this kind of shading technique, this shadowing technique, on the spotlights down the corridor. And, you know, I hop back to two, it's pretty close. So, uh, this is kind of another use case, and one I actually consider to be really quite important, of techniques not necessarily for use directly in-game, but offline while you're developing the game. Because ultimately, whether you bake your lights or whether you don't bake your lights, and we haven't done it, it's kind of just down to what suits the game and what kind of performance requirements and lots of limits and budgets you live within. Um, but being able to actually edit your lighting live and see what your results will be rather than have a cup of tea and then come back, I think is a really, really big deal um, because it will mean you get to the best looking answer sooner. So even if this technique never makes it into a game, um, there's still another use case for this offline. So jumping right to the conclusion, this is what the algorithm can currently do. So with um, a spotlight um, with a fairly small area, I can get a soft little blur off this slide. And that's not particularly exciting. In fact, if you're trying to use this algorithm for this, you just stick with uh, percentage versus filtering, it'll sort you out perfectly. That costs about a millisecond, which is way more than percentage versus filtering should cost. Um, but if I make the sphere a bit bigger, um, then I get a, a much softer shadow. Um, and, I, and it varies based upon distance. So, for instance, just to the kind of edge of the red and uh, yellow waffles, you can see that kind of the concept of the shadow hardens a bit, whereas the blue one which is actually floating more off the surface, um, which is kind of possibly hard to see in a static environment. Um, uh, it's, it's definitely further away and gets a kind of blurrier result. So that's quite nice. But that costs four milliseconds. So that's quite expensive. Plus, it's also something that you could probably do um, with another algorithm, although this does have a very nice look about it. Right? It's a very natural feel. Now, this is a much larger sphere, and you can see that the shadows are significantly softer. And again, you still have that kind of contact hardening, but everything's definitely a lot, a lot softer. And this is this is the point at which I think this algorithm cuts into its own. Um, prior to this, you might be able to find, even, but you probably can find a better algorithm. When you start talking about an area like that's that big. Um, then this algorithm is, is kind of, I think, is, is, uh, is, is fighting on home ground. You know, if I take it really to an extreme, um, which is about as large as I can make the sphere without it just covering the shadow itself, um, then, you can, then you can see I, have, you know, I still have contact shadows, still nice and blurry, but this only costs five milliseconds. So to wind back a few stages, that was four seconds, and that was five milliseconds. So, this isn't exploding exponentially as um, uh, as I increase the area. Now, five milliseconds is expensive, but it's livable. So, things to know straight away. So, this is a deferred shading approach. I've already computed um, G buffers, positions, and normals for the scene geometry, and I have a shadow map for my light, and I'm running a, a CUDA kernel over the screen. I like this in CUDA. Um, computing a visibility factor per, per pixel um, for how what proportion um, of the light can uh, this pixel see. And then I can just shade that with um, the actual spotlight fall off um, and, and, and output the results on the screen. So there's only really one kernel that matters, which is this compute visibility kernel. Now, the nice thing about a deferred style approach is that it's not really proportional to the number of lights you have on screen, at least in principle. Um, you can break the screen up in advance into tiles and color them effectively. And as long as there's not very much overlap in the light, um, you have 
a pretty good upper limit on, on the cost of the whole thing. So the number of lights is less important, but it is very sensitive to screen resolution. If you try and output this over you know, 2,000 by 1,000, um, it will cost a lot more than running it on a um, 1,000 by 768 uh, screen. Now, you can do some things to mitigate that, which I'll talk about later, but that's the basic, um, that's the basic uh, situation that we play with. Now, this algorithm is also sensitive to shadow complexity. Um, it will run faster, given simple shadows, than it will with hard shadows, as in shadows that have a lot of information, a lot of stuff to integrate. So the waffles in that scene are actually quite hard. And the other thing to know is that this algorithm has a huge number of sliders. And the reason that I can get that previous scene um, with the very, very, very big um, area lights run at five milliseconds is I sit there with all these sliders and I tune them all um, and I find a performance quality spot until it works. Now, that is a problem for this algorithm, but frankly. It's not self-tuning. Um, and partly because what performance trade-offs you can make do depend upon the shadow um, it's casting and scene content and so on and so forth in screen resolution. Some of it I reckon you could probably figure out automatically, but it's definitely a, a, a limitation that I would like to find a better way around. Um, if you leave all the, all the dials set and just simply make the light bigger and smaller, um, the performance goes up and down um, quite dramatically. Um, if you make it bigger and then it readjusts the sliders to pick a different um, uh, performance trade-off, um, then you can still get very good looking shadows, but for a kind of equivalent performance. So just to give a quick description of the kind of things that um, I'd be looking at normally, um, uh, if you can see on the left hand side of the screen here, I have a whole load of various debugging options, some of them including a screen upscale factor. So for instance, I compute the shadowing at a, uh, in this case, a quarter size buffer on screen and then upsample it to uh, the full screen. And I can control how aggressively I do that. I can also clamp um, the a maximum amount of work that I want the kernel to do, um, which in cases that it needs to actually do more work would introduce light leaking. But I can, if I know that I don't need to do any more work than a, a certain amount, I can force it to clamp and I might get visually acceptable results. Similarly, I could downsample the shadow map before I added, actually put it through, which makes it do less work and so on and so forth. Um, now, the observant among you might notice that this actually isn't saying for four to five milliseconds. This is saying sort of eight to nine milliseconds at the minute. And this is true um, because pretty much the same size sphere as I had in an early example um, which did run at five milliseconds, here runs at uh, eight milliseconds, simply because of different slider settings. You know, and that's, that's really quite a considerable difference. So those sliders make quite a, um, are genuinely quite important. Now, if, you, if I toggle between two of these, and you just look at the shadow that's coming off the red and yellow and blue waffles, so that's the slightly higher, the slightly higher quality version, it takes 8 milliseconds, that's the 5 millisecond version, you should have to see that we've lost some fidelity. But we've lost fidelity in a sense that hasn't introduced really seriously ugly artifacts, it's actually just made the whole thing slightly blurrier, which given that we're after a fairly blurry result anyway, is actually not too bad a, a compromise. Um, and so it, the algorithm scales in this direction quite nicely. If you kind of cut back the sliders a fair bit, you end up with blurry looking results. You lose fidelity. You lose a bit of contact hardening. Um, but otherwise, it's kind of fairly acceptable. Now, this is a version of exactly the same scene, but computed with a reference algorithm um, that's basically setting all the dials to 11 and just letting it go wild. And that takes 60 milliseconds to, to, to compute. So it's very, very expensive. Um, and you can see Kind of, this is what the algorithm would do, given as much time as you'd care to give it. And it's done a really pretty good job here. You can see you get nice contact hardening and so on and so forth. So obviously, there's a huge difference between in, in this range, um, which is kind of both a blessing and a curse. So this algorithm does allow you to take something that, in, in, sort of, in principle, should take 60 milliseconds and cut it down to 5, um, but not, not necessarily fully automatically. And when it gets it wrong, it becomes essentially unusable. Now, um, you might be interested in how this compares to the ground truth. So this is a ray trace version of exactly the same scene. Um, and you can see that actually the contact shadow really, really does get quite hard under that uh, yellow waffle. So we're definitely not, cap not capturing all the fine details here. Plus, if I zoom in, 
uh, on the very close version, you can see that there's lots of little subtle structure in the in the shadow, and that's really really very very hard to calculate. It really genuinely does require you to exhaustively compute all the visibility. But do we care? I don't. Uh, if you need that kind of fidelity, you have to basically re address it. So that's kind of where I cut our limits. So now I've presented roughly where we will end up. Let's wind back right back to the start and talk about um, uh, the kind of approaches that we could use for this. So um, first of all, there's a whole set of shadow techniques that essentially I'd, I'd call like a fixed size kernel approach. Uh, this includes percentage closer filtering and also variant shadow mapping and convolution shadow maps and exponential shadow maps, um, which I'd recommend, um, and a whole bunch of others, and it's absolutely statistical. Um, but fundamentally, you only deal with applying a kernel in such a way that you get a constant blur everywhere. And this doesn't give you contact hardening, and so it's never really going to be particularly appropriate for what we're looking at. Similarly, on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, you can ray trace the whole thing. And in principle, you could do some amount of real-time ray tracing to compute these kind of shadows. But I'm just going to strike both these options out immediately. So the two options that I'm going to discuss today are depth varying approaches, um, which essentially at this point is a percentage close to soft shadows and variants of the fixed size uh, kernels that I talked about earlier. Um, and pretty much all these techniques, and I hate to say this because there's probably some techniques that aren't based upon this approach, but the vast majority of them, at least the ones I can find, uh, appear to be based on this idea of computing an average block of depth. You're a pixel, and you need to show yourself, and you attempt to compute how far away are the majority of blockers between me and the light. And so, okay, right, well, we're halfway between me and the light. Okay, well, well based upon that, I'm going to do a little bit of maths, and I'm going to say, hey, well, you know, I'm probably this much occluded. So, um, the idea of contact uh, uh, shadow hardening kind of comes from that computation. If you're right next to something, you'll get a sharp shadow. If it's all far away, you'll get a lower shadow. It's kind of the bare essentials. Now, there's a second set of techniques which, are called, which I'd call back projection. And that's, they're the basis for this particular technique. Um, they are not based on computing an average block of depth, and instead, are more like an approximation to ray tracing. They attempt to actually compute visibility uh, in a physically plausible manner. But before we get to them, I think it's worth time spending, uh, well, it's worth spending a little bit of time talking about percentage closer soft shadows. Even though my album's not based upon it, it, it's an extraordinarily strong competitor. And if you were to go out and write a shadowing algorithm for, um, you know, for your uh, new game or you're thinking about the future, this is probably an algorithm you should take very, very, very seriously. So in informal terms, um, when you're shading a pixel, you um, take some estimate of the size um, uh, in your shadow map that you should try searching for occluders. And an occluder or blocker, in this sense, is some shadow map pixel that is closer to the light than you are. So you essentially iterate through a bunch of shadows within this region, looking for anything that is closer to the light, and uh, compute their depth and average it. This, as long as there is a valid notion of an average depth, this will give you that average depth. And if you assume that the light and yourself um, and your occluder are all parallel, then you could do a basic bit of maths and, and get a number essentially between 0 and 1 um, as to uh, uh, how occluded you may be. and then and, and on PCF on the kernel that comes out. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely quick overview, but essentially the, the key thing I want you to take away is that you're searching for this average block of depth, then you do a basic bit of geometry based on huge assumptions about what the scene contents are, not actually analyzing them, which gives you a PCF kernel width, which you then run and do normal PCF. In practice, that final step is not actually that important because you can avoid, once you know kind of what size kernel you're meant to be taught, uh, working with, you can avoid it um, by using um, uh, essentially the kind of fixed size kernel algorithms we were talking about before. And there's a lot of cool, uh, interesting techniques in this area. But the computing the average block of depth really is the key stage here. Now, the limitations of this technique are really that large number have become um, extraordinarily expensive because the larger an area you have to search, um, 
because you know, if your light is you know, half the size of your scene, you're basically going to end up searching uh, the entire shadow map for it. Um, that's extremely expensive. And you can choose to sample it stochastically to approximate the average block of depth, but if you get that wrong, then you'll see um, noise in the result, uh, which may not look particularly attractive. Um, so um, there's, there's no kind of inherent well, it's, it's not easy to solve the problem of, of making it scale up more nicely, um, although I'm, I'm, I'm sure that problem could be worked on. And the main problem I have with it really is that it, it's correct only when the assumptions that there is an average block of depth is true. Um, so here's, here's some screenshots of PCSS in action. Um, this is uh, taken from uh, the NVIDIA PCSS sample, and, and it's unfortunately a very simple scene. So um, I find it hard to make comparisons between what I'm going to show and, and this scene, but um, it's at least worth looking at. You can see you get kind of some nice um, lower shadows on the far left, you get the, um, the contact hardening, um, and you can sort of see perhaps that there's a little bit of a staircasing effect in it at this size. If I make the light larger, then you can, that kind of stepping effect um, becomes a lot more noticeable. This is using the largest kernel size that's available in the demo itself. Uh, but it, uh, to be perfectly honest, um, although there isn't an, an option beyond this in the sample, it's very plausible that you could just take more samples and make this noise go away. Um, this actually runs at about 200 frames a second, which puts you know, an upper limit on it being about 5 milliseconds, um, which is, and it's probably a bit less than that. So it's definitely cheaper than my technique, and it's producing pretty plausibly soft shadows. Um, but uh, it, I don't think it's quite a fair comparison, and I actually need to spend more time after this, hopefully, uh, trying to do a more direct comparison and appreciating where, at what point you cross from PCSS into my technique, and maybe what hybrids you could produce from the two. Uh, and if I was going to be really picky, I'd say that the shadows have this kind of linear fall-off look about them. They don't have a really soft feel to them. Um, but to be honest, I really might be being a little bit too picky there, given that you know, most of our uh, games that we see real time have almost no soft shadows in them at all. So, um, so that's PCSS. Um, now, if I should direct you further onto PCSS, I'd recommend that you pick up any of the uh, any of the literature on this page. Um, I'm, I'm sure the slides will be available after the talk um, on the AltDevCon site. Um, so I don't know about screwing about uh, screwing them down about now. Um, Almost all of it seems to have come out of NVIDIA for some reason. I have no idea why, but they pretty much own all the research on this one. So, back projection. So, back projection is quite different to PCSS. Um, and the basic idea is to consider that your light source is rectangular and have a single shadow map um, oriented to the center of that uh, rectangular light and to treat the textiles in the shadow map as basically being uh, occluders floating in space. So, um, your main problem with, uh, uh, with lighting something in back projection is that you're a pixel and you need to somehow find um, the shadow texels that are between you and the light, um, which is the hard part, and then when you have them, to essentially push them away from your point, so to sort of project them back onto the light source itself, um, which and projects them onto a, 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 literally the 2D light source has clipped them to that and sum up the area. So it's kind of a physically based thing. You have some actual geometry in the scene, you're doing a projection, um, and then doing some uh, you know, a analytically integrating the, uh, the, uh, the visibility. And there's a lot of variants uh, um, of this approach. Um, it, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk through it, um, all of them in a second. Um, now, I've essentially taken a mix of the different back projection approaches and extended it a bit, so um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk through it. So in a little bit more detail, up front, you take your shadow map and build a set of the other shadow maps that form a kind of a, a hierarchy. Now, I, I think you should use when, to treat the word hierarchy in a very loose sense, and they don't have to actually be a tree that has a single pixel at the top and goes down to the full shadow map at the bottom. It could be a hierarchy of maps that are all the same size or anything in between. 
point is, is that on your first, um, if you, you consider it as a set of slices, the first slice is your original shadow map. The second slice is a shadow map where you've applied some kernel, say a 2x2, 3x3 kernel, and replaced the current, the, that will written out the pixel in that next layer to be the minimum and maximum values within that kernel itself. And so you can see that your maximum and minimum values kind of spread out across the layers and the further you get up, a bit like a blur operation. Um, this kind of gives you um, effectively a set of bounding boxes, if you'd like to think about it that way, um, for all the shadow geometry. Right at the bottom layer, they're just sort of infinitely thin slices. And further up the tree, you quite literally have um, a little frustum um, for each shadow pixel, which you, know, which you could actually construct geometry for uh, and do work with. So, uh, so let me hop sideways to the, uh, there we go, to the awesome power of paint to try and illustrate this, uh, um, this process. Essentially, here's our light source up here in 2D, and I will flatten it effectively to a bar, and I have a shadow map with a straightforward shadow map cone and it has a, a, a near plane of here. So I can't represent any, uh, any shadows from objects outside this cone or before this near plane, which is the limitation of this approach. Now, within this, um, I've got a couple of objects in my scene. Um, and if I'm going to try and shade this pixel down here, then the set of pixels initially that I need to look at to work out whether they could be between me and the light source is basically the entire shadow map. You, if you think carefully, um, I could have an occluder up here on the right hand side that essentially if back projected onto the light up here would block out the light from this little small portion up here. So I can't just, it's, it's unlikely that they're going to be there I should say because there's a, a large depth range here but it's plausible that they're there. Now, if I was to actually try and compute this pixel using brute force without doing anything slightly smarter, I'd literally have to iterate over every single pixel in the shadow map, which will deadlock your device and oh, it will basically reset the driver. And, 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 and you, you couldn't even run it in debug. Um, now, the trick to this technique is that with your min-max hierarchy, you have information uh, about um, uh, about the range of occluders. Now let's say I sample from my highest level of my Numex hierarchy and I discover that there are no occluders before this point here. Now given this information, I know now, if I can make, make do this, oops, that this is the area of, oops, let's try grabbing this and see if this works. This is basically the area of shadow map pixels, just this little interior bit here that can affect this point. Now, if I had a pixel out here, um, a shadow map pixel out here, it, um, you can now see that hopefully um, it, it would have to be, first of all, below this line because that's what my, um, my shadow map hierarchy is telling me. And therefore, if I projected it away from the main point here, it would end up back up here, um, well outside the light source. And only things inside this little uh, limited area here are going to actually affect it. And so by, by using the min-max information you see, I've massively cut down the search area that I actually had to look at. Um, it doesn't guarantee that it will cut down the search area, but it means that in the majority of cases, I will, I will be able to... Um, reject huge portions of, uh, of, uh, of shadow map pixels before even considering them. And so that's kind of how this, these algorithms work. Um, and I, I have my hierarchy and starting from uh, uh, a basic starting point of what area of the shadow map I, sh I should consider just from the geometry of the light and my, and my position in the near plane, um, I start with that search area and I refine it by the minimum depth until I hit an area that I can't really refine any further, and I iterate through all of those pixels, project them back onto the light source, work out what area they actually covered, and subtract that from the total amount of visible area. 
That's the basic scheme. Uh, and that was the scheme proposed um, by Gunnerboard in 2006. So it's actually quite an old technique now. Now, Gunnerboard's idea was to consider the occluders in the scene, if I wind on this back, as being parallel to the light source. So if I have a texel here, oops, and I have a texel here, it would come out like this. There would be sort of horizontal lines. They would be basically disconnected to uh, each other and sort of be sort of, well, blobs in the scene, really. Now, um, that makes it, uh, the projection maths really quite simple because they're all parallel to the plane. When you project them back onto the plane, they just form a 2D bounding box, which is really simple and trivial to, to clip. However, because they're not connected to each other, um, you can see uh, you can might, there might be gaps between them, or when you project them back, they might overlap each other. And so you can actually end up with issues of incorrectly calculating the occlusion either over or under. And that, in fact, has turned out to be a major problem. So although um, Gennaboard took pretty much 90% of the steps the way there, um, this parallel with the light source um, uh, idea was, was, was pretty much a killer. Um, now, this is an example of what you can do with that sort of min-max um, rejection information. Because uh, uh, I have some sort of spatial information about where the min and maxes are, I can early out on a whole load of pixels before I even begin searching them. Um, and just to show, you, I just want to show you this to show you how aggressive it can be. Only the pixels in the scene that are kind of grey, grey shaded, ignoring the far bit plane, are the ones that did any work whatsoever. All the rest were um, uh, exited out pretty much immediately. So those five milliseconds or eight milliseconds or whatever this particular scene that we came down to were just those pixels. So those pixels are taking a very, very, very long time to compute, um, which in itself is a bit of an issue, but um, uh, at least it's possible to reject a load of work. And it shows you how, um, if you were looking at a scene that had a very little amount of shadowing information in it, for whatever particular reason, it would run quite quickly. But if you ended up with a lot of complicated shadows on the screen, it could run quite slowly, so, which I wouldn't necessarily call it as a, as a strength. Now, um, uh, a year after Gennyboard published his 2006 paper, um, uh, Michael Schwartz um, uh, et al. published a paper called Bitmask for Soft Shadows. And in it, he had a couple of uh, interesting novel ideas on top of it. Um, the first was, I think, remarkably simple, but uh, uh, you've, got to, you've got to spot it to see it, if that makes any sense, to, um, was to join up the occluders to essentially treat each of the vertices, uh, each of the, uh, the points in the shadow map as being the vertices of quads, not being quads themselves. And so what you ended up with was a kind of like a, a vacuum packing of the scene. Now, instead of having gaps between uh, your occluders, uh, you've, you've now fixed that, so there's no under occlusion. But on the downside, there are no gaps between any of the occluders. So if you've got two occluders that are actually unrelated to each other, but one's in front of the other, there will be an occluding piece of geometry that kind of exactly as if you put them in a vacuum packing, back packing machine and, and sucked all the air out. There'll, there'll be this kind of stretch between them, um, which you actually have to detect and cull. But you can, you can do that fairly simply by looking at um, very, very steep edges and just rejecting them. So you have to kind of introduce your own gaps. Um, but otherwise, it fixed the, uh, the under-occlusion problem. And to fix the over-occlusion problem, he decided to, uh, instead of uh, just doing the basic 2D maths and adding it up and, and being done with it, was to, to represent the light uh, as a bit mask. Uh, and essentially, with a little bit of cleverness, you can, uh, you can put a sort of 16 by 16 um, anti-aliased pattern of bits uh, over the light. And when you do the 2D back projection, you can mask out these bits. Um, now, because you're just oring them in, um, if you end up with overlapping back projected geometry, then um, uh, they don't get ordered in anymore. So the, the over occlusion has gone away. This is actually quite a bit slower because you've got to store these bit masks in memory and the, the maths to sort it out is not necessarily trivial. Plus we're now back projecting um, arbitrary quads, which in practice can be quite fiddly. Um, um, and there's some various approximations and I'd have to just uh, uh, forward you to the paper at this point rather than talk any further about it. Um, but suffice to say, it adds complexity, 
it adds instructions, it adds uh, extra registers, but it does fix the main uh, problems with this technique. And just to show you how bad some of this can look, this is without using bit masks. You can see I've got uh, a light that is shadowed by both the blue and the yellow um, waffles uh, on this area right in the center, and I've got this kind of really ugly looking black blobby stuff. With the bit masks, that goes away and it looks perfect. So, although bit masks add a certain amount of cost, but, and in, for some teams you just won't need them, but when you need them, you really, really, really need them. They look really, um, really hard otherwise. And there was a huge load of follow-up literature. Um, some, uh, basically lots of people tried to take these techniques and make them significantly faster. Um, this is well worth reading. Um, now, to, hop, to kind of summarize them a bit, there's kind of two main themes that popped out of all this follow-up. One was that there's still a lot of redundancy in screen space. Even though you're early outing uh, very frequently, um, your shadows, particularly when they become very, very blurry, compute almost the same answer as you'd expect. And so there was a lot of uh, research into trying to reconstruct the final output from sparse data or to packetize um, the pixels together so that you only, you know, only compute, say, four pixels in, in one go. Um, Similarly, because there was quite a lot of searching going on still, um, uh, even once you've refined your search area, um, people looked at, well, perhaps what, what happens if then instead of just iterating through all the pixels within our final search area, we actually sort of subdivide it adaptively, or we try and trace the contours and so on and so forth. And, and, and so the kind of advances really fall into what combination of these two camps um, people used. And so this is the point I've picked. Um, so I use um, Schwartz's approach of uh, using clues with a continuous surface, and I use his bit masks, but I also provide an option that doesn't have one if you want to turn it off. And I do adaptive subdivision of the final search area to actually find the bits that I need to back project. Um, plus, in order to do some of the screen space upsampling, I can use it at a lower resolution, and I do a 5x5 five by five, um, bilateral upsample. Because I only need to rely upon the positions to compute the final result, then, um, uh, then I don't have any kind of high frequency content. So bilateral upsampling actually works extremely well. Um, to build the shadow map hierarchy, I also took a slightly interesting approach of using a 3 by 3 um, symmetric filter, where you've got the kind of pixel in question in the middle of the filter. Having a symmetric filter is actually really useful, um, because if you're, unless you're decimating aggressively, you're um, having a selection filter stops the information kind of only progressing in one way. Imagine if you have a 2 by 2 filter, um, which is oriented to the top left corner, then um, you kind of all your information is sucked from one side rather than from the others. And there's, there's a load of other bells and whistles. Um, here's an example of the shadow map we actually can uh, produce. And I actually found that because we're trying to target this very, very blurry end of things, you can just downsample the shadow map initially to a 256, and then produce all of the rest of the layers at the same resolution. Um, that kind of keeps memory under control um, and it preserves a lot of spatial information that you need. And 3x3 three three is still slightly arbitrary. I was umming and about doing 5x5. Five five. Um, I think that's, uh, that might be something else to consider. So here's a slightly under the hood look. This gray shaded area that covers the majority of the screen represents the entire shadow map. The green area represents the search area that I would have if I did no cleverness. That's the kind of area of the light that, um, that could contain occluders, areas of, area of the shadow map that could occlude the visibility between me and the rectangular light source. And then this kind of uh, adaptively refined area is the area that I actually um, iterated over. And you can see the red pixels are the ones I actually back projected. So a lot of work goes into kind of tunneling down just to project really kind of a handful of pixels. Um, uh, also to give you an example, this is what the bilateral uh, upsampling looks like. Um, that's the final result, and that's what it turned off. And you can see that there's a bit of kind of graininess and noise there that the bilateral upsampling sorts out. So it actually kind of adds that final little bit of blur, um, which is quite nice. Um, the CUDA impl implementation is probably worthy of a, uh, of a talk of its own. Um, but it's way too long to talk through at this point, so uh, I, I'm afraid I'll, I'll have to defer it to another day. Um, basically, um, there's, a, there's a 
cool bit of um, bit mangling that goes into dealing with the efficient stack, um, which I could answer questions on, but I'm afraid I'll have to skip on because I, I know I'm now out of time. Um, but otherwise, it's uh, uh, there's, there's generally quite a lot of work that went into this, unfortunately, and I can sort of talk about individual bits and pieces and some of the problems that I ran into, but um, but I certainly couldn't talk through all of the code. Um, so in the final analysis, uh, I've run into kind of two sort of big question marks over this. So first of all, I have a problem that each of the pixels do too much work. Remember we saw that early out picture, that early out picture where there was only a small number of pixels on the screen that actually any, did any heavy work, but the whole thing took like sort of five, eight milliseconds. Those pixels are taking ages. Now, the classic approach for a GPU here is just track more threads of it. But if I did that, lots of my threads would be doing redundant work, which I actually also need to claw back, because I have this similar problem that even though I have this group of pixels uh, on screen, almost every pixel is the same. Or within a limited area, those pixels could still be grouped together in packets, and you could still squeeze redundancy out further, but that would reduce the number of threads further. Um, similarly, I have uh, effectively a divide and conquer algorithm, but I actually find this very hard to add extra threads to. Divide and conquer, sort of, we're, 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 we're told should help uh, you know, parallelization of your threads, but just the way the threading model on GPUs works, it's, you can't really kind of create threads on the fly um, as you're descending these trees, and descending them kind of is a Therefore, sort of limited to being a serial task. So I'm not quite sure how to best balance these. Um, um, there's definitely a lot more. Definitely, the machine's doing more work than it needs to, but it's finding a way to kind of squeeze the, uh, um, the redundancy out. Um, so the bottom line is, I think it's looking good. Um, the performance is okay, but its variability is quite an issue. And I, I'm, I, I'm interested in making um, uh, a very practical result, but. Uh, the fact you have to kind of tune it a lot is a bit of an issue for me. Um, but it definitely is accurate enough for baked preview. Um, so I, so I'm, I'm kind of hoping to see a bit more of that. And we're, we're going to put it into uh, enlightenment and ship this in the next release um, and see how much um, utilization it gets. Um, uh, so that's kind of the future work I've presented. Also, I'd like to hop back to PCSS, which I think is still a very interesting technique. Now, one thing I might do after this, if I decide to continue with this work even further, although I was going to can this before Christmas, um, is to consider a mid-ground between this and PCSS. Um, PCSS might be more plausible where you generally don't want to spend four milliseconds. Um, now, uh, and maybe there's some of the techniques that we can take from the back projection and blend with PCSS, like this idea of not just having one average blocker depth. Maybe we can do more kind of subdivision um, to uh, maybe compute sort of local um, local PCSS kernels or something like that. I'm not really quite sure. Um, however, I have access to a huge amount of information here. I can quite literally dump the entire running of the kernel um, uh, out to memory um, and analyze the entire thing after the event. So um, I, can, I can generate some stats about what, you know, do what ifs hopefully and uh, try and decide um, what further ways to optimize it. Um, otherwise, that would be a re bit of recommended reading. And uh, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Steve, we have a question. Thank you, Sam. So we got a question. Um, I'll already forward it to you. And I can read it out loud now for everyone. Would combining PCSS with the MinMax shadow map to remove work be interesting for saving performance? And this and thus allowing larger kernel sizes? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, that, is, that is something I'm, I'm hoping will be possible. Um, when I started doing this work, um, I, I kind of wrote PCSS off, um, mainly because I didn't see a way that I could, uh, I could make it deal with larger kernels. Um, and probably the... So, I mean, there's two problems with, it, with the technique that I currently have. One is that the adaptive subdivision does a very, very good job, almost a too good a job, of finding the areas that need to do work. But it takes so long and is so serial, in some sense, of getting to there that I'm wondering whether, given the current state of the hardware, um, it really is the best way forward. But then again, um, maybe if we tone it down a bit so that um, 
it's only doing kind of much lighter subdivision than I'm making it do for this algorithm. Maybe I could blend it with PCSS and use, as you say, the, the, the Minimax hierarchy to kind of do a series of smaller subdivided P, uh, PCSS kernels and combine the end result together. And I, I think it's generally a, um, a, you know, a, an, an interesting question for the future. I'd like to see uh, more work done on that, I must admit. Okay, so I love the next question. Um, do you plan to present your technique in more detail, GPU Pro article, source code release, etc.? Uh, yes, I'd like to. Um, I, I kind of, I suppose I sort of haven't yet finished, and I must actually force myself to stop this. Um, um, I think GDC will basically be the line. Um, so uh, yes, I think I think it does need a more detailed write-up. Um, it's funny to if you work on something for six months, you can tend up end up building almost too much up to talk. And I, I found it quite hard for this talk to actually work out what bit I should distill down into the talk. Um, because I, ha I appreciated that I probably have to explain a lot of the background to back projection before I kind of could start talking in detail about some of the trade-offs I had to make. Um, so uh, yeah, may, may, maybe a GPU Pro article or, um, uh, or, or a general publication if I, if I do a proper comparison, um, I think would be the way forward. 